in the film, it's so difficult. You reference these films from the 70s, like California Split, which is also a very talky and wonderful movie about these two guys. And, and this movie has this great visual composition that carries us through in spite of the fact that we're really just watching a conversation. Can you talk about how, what, what was your visual approach and how you worked with your editor to create that rhythm that makes it infinitely watchable, um, even though it's, it's this ongoing conversation? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The, 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 the first things that came to me when I, when I read the script, there were two pieces of music and one film that I haven't mentioned. Uh, the pieces of music were the Brian Eno song, Big Ship, which plays at the end, New Orleans Instrumental Number 1, the R.E.M. Uh, song that plays at the beginning, <clears throat> and uh, Don't Look Back, the Dave Pennebaker documentary, um, was something that I just couldn't get out of my head. It popped into my mind. and um, Pennebaker meant a lot to me. as one of my teachers in, in college. Um, and that film, I mean, you know, that, that sense, it, it's a once-in-a-lifetime film of just, at, at that point in, in Dylan's life, I mean, he was all of, what, maybe 24, 25, and the world was calling him a prophet and a god, and he thought it was a bunch of bullshit, you know? And, and he was kind of a dick to a lot of people and totally, like, lied, I mean, a lot about himself. But there's such a sense of surrogacy with the camera. Like, you feel like you are, oh my god, I'm in the center of the cultural universe right now. It's sort of, it's a black hole sucking in towards Bob Dylan, whether he wants it or not. And I, I want to be as close to that as possible. That's how I, as a film goer, feel when I watch that film. And I was like, that, that's kind of what we, this should feel like to some degree. It's certainly what it feels like to David Lipsky. Um, and, you know, we, myself and my, um, the cinematographer I worked with, uh, it's a Swedish cinematographer named Jakob Eri, who works with Joaquin Trier. So they had shot Reprise and Oslo August 31st and Louder Than Bombs, which is coming out. He's shot snow before, <laughs> as a Scandinavian. Um, but we, you know, we, again, we talked, I mean, endlessly, I just focused on the subjectivity of it, which is, this is David Lipsky's story. This is his point of view. This is his experience. This is his version of David Foster Wallace. Nothing else matters to that degree. You know, I mean, we did our research, but Lipsky is a first-rate journalist. He was a first-rate, it's not, it's not almost famous, where it's a sort of fawning teenager and a rock and roll star. David Lipsky at age 30, had just had a novel that was a very well-reviewed novel, a collection of short stories that were mostly published in The New Yorker, and he was writing for Rolling Stone. If David Foster Wallace didn't exist, he would have been one of the most successful young writers in America. Um, so you know what I mean, it, but it's a, a big shadow um, that you're in when you're the guy that just wrote a book that sort of changes literature to some degree. But everything was from Lipsky's point of view. So the camera, everything, that sort of was a guiding principle. When we meet Wallace, I mean, there's the rush of memory at the beginning is inherently subjective, and then you're sort of seeing Wallace from his point of view. You're seeing him through through his eyes, across the room, out of focus. Eventually, it becomes more of an even two-hander. That's sort of how it is initially. Um, and then the other collaborators I had, I mean, there's so many, but like Jerry Sullivan, our production designer, who's the art director for Wes Anderson, and then did me and our own The Dying Girl. Like, there was just a lovely specificity and great collaboration between him and Jakob, and what we talked about a lot was that a lot of times in films that I've seen, especially American independent films that take place in winter, they use winter as a sort of cheap and easy metaphor for like existential despair or nihilism or something, which is not the way I relate to winter. Winter's exotic to me, I'm from Georgia. We're in Texas. Um, and so the films that we talked about, the snowy films, you know, we talked about Dr. Chivago, you know, White Christmas, uh, Fanny and Alexander, and we watched actually some Wong Kar Wai films too, and actually talk, talking about films that actually have warmth, as how much warmth can we introduce into this film that inherently, because it's the Midwest and winter, are gonna have a lot of white and gray and brown. So that kitchen, I mean, there's pale greens, pale yellows. We wanted to be a film that you like living in, as opposed to something that just objectifies these guys and talks about alienation, because it's not. This, this, this is an unrequited love story, I think. I think that's what it is for David Lipsky. When we arrived at Jason's name, I had always been a fan um, since Freaks and Geeks, which also I saw in college. It actually really affected me. Like, I think it's maybe the most beautifully cast teen ensemble I've ever seen. Like that, My So-Called Life, Days and Confused, Last Picture Show, American Graffiti, on the Fast Hunter's Mount High. And Jay, for all the actors that came out of it, he's the emotional anchor of it. He's honest, he has sad eyes, he's someone that you lean into and want to spend time with. The way I feel when I watch early performances from like Jimmy Stewart, or Tom Hanks, or Jack Lemmon. <clears throat> and then, when he was in Forgetting Sarah Marshall, he wrote that role. He's a writer. Like, when he was in the Muppets movie, which I'm gonna show to my kid when he's like old enough, like Jason was the one that personally revived that franchise and wrote that script. And he's writing a Lego sequel, and he's got a second children's book coming out. He's a writer. 
And there's something for all the writers in the room that you know that you can't fake. The process of actually trying to get the ideas that are in your head that you think are brilliant onto a page and failing 99% of the time, feeling inept and small and impotent to actually do anything and then submitting it to the scrutiny of other people and letting them eviscerate it. And then doing it again and again if you're lucky enough to get it out there having critics eviscerate it. Like, it's, you have to be a real masochist. Most people quit, most people don't finish their script, don't finish their book, and those that do, they're addicted to it and they have to do it. Um, and it's a specific temperament that Jason Siegel knows really well. So does Jesse Eisenberg, he's also a writer. So is that meeting with Jason and just realizing how, how complicated he is? Um, you know, he only recently, <clears throat> in the past couple weeks, on the Mark Maron thing, started talking about being sober, which is something he'd been private about until then. Um, he's just thoughtful and um, really smart, and not at all like the guy he played on TV.